Todd Daniels, and I'm on staff here at Shiloh. And we are so glad that you're here to be a part of our night worship service. And as Billy mentioned, we're going to have a great time on October 23rd under the shed at JB's. Now, when I say the shed, just know it's a nice place. It's not some hole in the wall. It's nice. And JB's going to cook up some good hot dogs for us. And we're going to have an old-timey worship service. We're going to have some banjos and acoustic guitars. And it's going to be great. And uh, we're going to gather together as the church. And we're going to sing some songs together. And uh, we'll give you a chance probably to even pick some hymns out. And we we might sing a few choruses of some of your favorite hymns. But we're looking forward to having that time together with you. If you did not get, when you came in, an insert, it has a place for you to sign up to reserve your family space. Um, If you plan on coming to be a part of that, we would like for you to RSVP. Just fill that out, and you can place it either here on the stage um, after the service, or those buckets are back there in the back. You can fill it out there. Just leave it laying in your seat. We'll get it one way or another. But we want you to come. We don't want you to miss out on that because it's going to be a great time together. So let's transition. Let's talk about written and read because we are in the second part of a sermon series that we started last Sunday. And we say written and read, and, and you're probably your first thought when you saw written and read, you're probably thinking about the red letters of Jesus in the Gospels. How many of you have a, let, a red letter edition of the Bible where Jesus' words are in red? Aren't those helpful when you're looking like, I know Jesus said this, and it's really helpful that when you turn there, they're in red. But We are talking about that in part, but what we're really trying to emphasize is the fact that there was a price to be paid for us to have a Bible today. There were those who, because they believed so much and their faith was so strong in what God did through Jesus, through the gospel. As that video said, these people went out and they spread throughout the Roman Empire, championing the cause of Christ, telling everybody what Jesus had done. They didn't go saying, hey, by the way, I'm so-and-so, and and nice to meet you. They went, they had a message. And the message was this, that God had done something through his son, Jesus Christ. And that now all of the world can be saved because of what he has done. And they went carrying that message. And we read Paul last Sunday from the Romans epistle in chapter 1, verse 16. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Remember, Paul's saying this to Rome, to folks in Rome. And he said, I'm not ashamed, meaning I don't care who you stand me in front of. I will stand in front of Caesar and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is Lord. Because in that gospel, in that news, is salvation for all who believe. For in it, the power of God has been demonstrated through what God did through his son, Jesus. And he said, I'm not ashamed of this message. And I long to come to Rome and preach it. But here's a snippet of what I mean by the gospel. And that's pretty much the Romans epistle. He's going to go on and he's going to give us a great explanation of the gospel that Paul preached. And so today I want us to think about this. You've heard it. And you've heard it. How many of you have grown up in church all your lives? Okay. You've heard this word gospel a lot. Haven't you? You've heard it a lot. Today we're going to do something a little different. Today I'm going to be Oprah Winfrey, but in the form of a man. <laughs> and white. <laughs> and um, sometimes you had to have a refresher course in school before the exam, right? How many of y'all remember those days? You had to have a refresher. So a lot of times you'd study, you'd go back to see, what does this mean so I can pass the test? So this morning we're going to have a pop quiz. So you said you've been raised in church, and you've heard this word gospel, but what is the gospel? What is it? So I want you who are bold enough, who are brave enough in front of all these friends and family, we're loved ones, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. There are no, there are no wrong answers. That's what I tell the youth all the time. There are no wrong answers. We're going to work on it together. We're going to figure it out together. So if you think that you know what the gospel is, if somebody came up to you and said, hey, what's the gospel? What would you say to them? If you think you know what the answer to that is, just raise your hand and I'm coming to you. So don't be scared. Just be brave. Okay, we got Priscilla over here. She's going to tell us. Tell us what you think, Priscilla. What is the gospel? I think it's the indisputable thing that God was born by a virgin. Okay. That he died on the cross, rose in three days, and he was sinless. Okay, all right, good. Hey, that was good, wasn't it? Who thinks they got 
a, a great answer, too. Who thinks you got a great answer? Let me see. Raise your hand. Somebody else. Pearl has an answer. Let's watch this mic right here because it might feed back. So let me get right here. I'm just going to say the Lord's forgiveness because he forgave us for all the sins. He went to the cross for us. And throughout life, we are sinners. Mm. And until our death comes, sometimes we don't know. But when we're forgiven by him, that's, that's right. the ultimate. That's right. These are great answers. Anybody else? Anybody else think you got a great answer? This little guy over here. Let's hear it. Let's hear your answer. What do you think? So if, if one of your friends came to you and said, hey, man, what's the gospel? What would you say? The holy word. Okay, the holy word. Okay. it's a pretty good answer. All right, who else? Anybody? Or are we done? Mike, you got something? I'm coming back here to Mike. Tell us what you think, Mike. To me, the gospel is the word of Jesus, our salvation. And the easiest way for me to share that is to talk to children. Because children are always wanting to hear a story. So I wear a salvation bracelet. And if anybody doesn't know what a salvation bracelet's about, I'll be glad to share it with you. Michael leads you to the Lord if you don't know him, okay? <laughs> Anybody else? This little lady over here. She says she's got an answer, too. So let's hear it. What you think? God is the gospel. God is the gospel. Okay. All these are great answers, aren't they? So what I want you to think about now is, is if you gave that answer, that's great. These are all great answers. But could you turn to a place in your Bible and say, here is the gospel? Without reading verse after verse after verse after verse, could you just turn to one passage in Scripture and say, here's the gospel? If you have your Bibles with you today, you can. You can. That's the good news, isn't it? That you can. The whole reason why we're doing this is because, listen, church, listen. The church has lost sight of the gospel. We have made church so much more than what it should be about. It's the gospel. Because we have to remember this. Jesus saved you from your sins so that you could become an ambassador for his kingdom. He saved you from your sins and has now given you purpose in life. You, folks, listen. We are now part of a greater purpose than anything else that's around us. I mean, it's such a great purpose that Jesus said, if you don't love me more than your mother or your father, your husband or your wife, your sons and your daughters, what did he say? You cannot be my disciple. That's how strong the purpose is. That's how high the purpose is. And he has called us into that. Today, if you say in your heart, Jesus is Lord, then you are saying that he's Lord with a big fat capital L of your life. He's Lord. Meaning, I follow his orders, and I now live for him. And he said this. A lot of times churches talk about, oh, the end of times is coming, the end of times is coming, and here's the date, you know. Listen, anybody ever tells you the date, just go ahead and run away because you're with the crazy people. Because <laughs> even Jesus himself said that he didn't know the date. But he didn't tell us to focus on that, did he? When the disciples said, hey, Jesus, will you bring the kingdom in? He, didn't, he said, guys, you're missing the point. You shall be my witnesses. And he says, and where? In Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. Go and preach the gospel. That's what he told the church to do. Now, we lost our way along the way. But the purpose of this sermon series is to get us back focused on what we're supposed to be about, and that's the gospel. Because, see, along the way, the church oftentimes gets sidetracked. We get sidetracked. We are humans. And we start making this something that it was never supposed to be. We make it about so many things that are not even important that we shouldn't even be talking about. And the Apostle Paul addressed this, so here's your passage. If anybody ever says to you, hey, Where's the gospel? What is the gospel? Say, oh, right here. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the Apostle Paul here, of course, is writing to the church in Corinth. 
If you were here Wednesday night, you heard me give a little introduction to this epistle. Simply this, we have to remember, to whereas Romans, Paul's writing, giving an explanation of the gospel he preaches, here we see Paul taking theological things and bringing them to address the issues that this church is dealing with. Keeping in mind that Corinth was very much a culture that would be on the equivalent of taking Los Angeles and Las Vegas and New York City and smashing them all together. And this is where this church was. So you can imagine the things they're dealing with. These people have been caught out of this culture. They have been brought into the family of God. And now they're trying to figure out what does it mean to be followers of Christ in this culture. So they have issues. So they write letters to Paul. Hey, Paul, what about this and what about that? And this is going on in the church and that's going on in the church. And so Paul's addressing those issues in this epistle. So right here he's addressing the issue of resurrection. He's addressing the issue of resurrection. Because there were some who were starting to doubt that Jesus had rose from the dead. So this is what Paul is dealing with here. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. So keep that in mind. This is the message I preached to you which also you received, in which you stand. So I came to you, preached this message to you, this gospel message, this good news to you. Okay, And I preached that to you. You received it by faith, and you're standing on it, meaning you have placed your life, your faith in this hope, by which you are also saved. If you hold fast, verse 2, that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. This is the message that saves you. Your faith in Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection, this is the gospel. This is what you have been saved by. Okay, And if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, if you'll hold fast to that, this is what is saving you. This is what's saving me. It's not this one-time event. The church for a long time thought, oh, if I just walk the aisle and give my life to Christ, I'm saved. Well, we're continuing to be saved daily because Christ is saving us from ourselves daily. Okay? And he's saying, now, this is what is yours unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That Here's the gospel. This is it right here. Okay? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. If anybody ever said to you, hey, what's the gospel? This is it right here. Chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, what are the scriptures? According to the Hebrew Bible. According to all that the Hebrew Bible had to say. He died just as those scriptures said that he would for our sins. You can look at Isaiah chapter 53 and see this here, where Isaiah is talking about the servant who will come, and he will die. He will be beaten for us, right? And then he says, so he died for us for our sins. He did something for us that we could never do for ourselves, fulfilling what the scripture said. Verse 4, and that he was buried. Now this is big. That means, listen, there can be no resurrection unless he died and was buried. There can't be a resurrection. He had to be dead, 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 and buried. Otherwise, this would mean nothing. It would mean nothing. But since he was buried and he was dead, then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Along the way when Jesus was with his disciples, they'd be walking along and he'd say, we're going to Jerusalem, and here the Son of Man will be, be betrayed into the hands of men, and he will die and will be crucified, but he will rise again on the third day. And the disciples are like, what? <laughs> he, they, hey, he said it again. I don't, I don't know what you mean by this. He said it, and he did it according to the Scriptures. Verse 5, and that, check this out. We know this to be true. Because he was seen by Cephas. So this would be Peter. That's his name in Aramaic. And then by the twelve. So he was seen by them. After that, he was also seen by over 500 brethren at once. 
Now listen, he just didn't like appear as like some ghost. Go read John chapter 21, and where do we find Jesus but sitting on the shore of Galilee eating fish with his disciples? You can't be a spirit and be sitting there eating fish. He was raised in a body, a transformed body, but he still was able to eat with them. He was seen by over 500 brethren, which, by the way, this is the only account in the New Testament that we have after the resurrection where it says that he was seen by 500 people. Paul has a lot of weight and a lot of authority in what he's saying here because we know Paul's testimony. He was not a believer at first. He was somebody who came afterwards, and he's going to say that right here. He says, so he was seen by 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, meaning that at the time I'm writing this, a lot of these folks are still alive, but some have fallen asleep, meaning some have died. Verse 7, after that, he was seen by James. That would be his half-brother, Jesus' half-brother, the guy who wrote the epistle, James. And then by who? By all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me also. As by one born out of due time. I wasn't one yet, but in God's time, I encountered the resurrected Lord. He says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, who I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. Why was his grace not in vain? Because I have labored more than any of these guys preaching this message. I have labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So listen, it, the whole church, all of them who had seen the resurrected Lord, they were out telling everybody about this event that happened. Why? Because this event is what gives Jesus validity to anything he ever said or did. It wouldn't mean anything had he not rose from the dead. It'd just be another great teacher who came along and taught some good stuff. He was just a great moral teacher. But no, he did something nobody else has ever done since, and that God raised this one from the dead to show the world that he is the Son of God and that you can believe him. And this is the message that went out. This is the gospel. And written in red is simply this. We know in the New Testament... We know the lives of those. They all died martyrs' deaths. Why? For preaching this message. They were simply just preaching a message. But they also had created such a community that was irresistible within the Roman Empire. In the Christian community, women had value. For the first time ever, women had value and just weren't second-class citizens in the property of men. They were valued. Children were valued for the first time. Children had a place in the community of Christ. They were valued. And this was irresistible to a culture that was primarily made up of slaves. Here, my life matters. When I'm with these people, I feel loved. When I'm with these people, I feel accepted. And it's all because of this one, Jesus. And they heard this story over and over and over. And the church went forward telling that story over and over and over. And nothing ever stopped them. When the empire came against them, they stood up even stronger. In the face of opposition, they stood up willing to die for it. Because they believed it so much. Think about that for a second. There are very few things that is worth dying for. None of us are just going to give up our lives for nothing. In fact, we fight for our life. When you get sick, where do you go? To the doctor. Why? Because you're fighting for your life. I know something's wrong. I need to get this fixed. Why? Because I want to live. I haven't met anybody who was just like ready to die. I don't want to live. Well, I guess some people do say that, but you know what I mean. Most people, most people embrace life, want to live. And here's the thing. You're very careful about what you're willing to lay your life down for. These people believed this message so much that they were willing to die for it. And listen, they didn't retaliate. They didn't fight back. They let whatever happened happen. And here's the reason why. Because they believed that day they would be with Jesus. They believed in the resurrection so much that they were willing to let these things happen. Because they always had a chance to say no. They always had a chance to say 
You're right, I don't believe this anymore. You're right. And they could live. But that would be like lying. They would say, no. I know that he rose. I know he rose from dead. You want to know why? Because he changed my life. He is a risen Savior. He's changed my life. And being a part of the community of faith has changed my life. And I'm, I'm willing to pay that price. Because Jesus died for me, I'm willing to die for him. Listen to this in closing. I brought one of my favorite books. I love church history. But when we step outside of the New Testament, we have these accounts from people who weren't even Christians. We have a secular historian here. His name is Tacitus. He tells us about, how many of you guys ever heard of the fires of Rome that Nero blamed the Christians on? This happened in AD 64. A great fire breaks out in Rome. Most people would say that Nero started the fire. Most Romans believe that Nero started the fire, but he blamed it on Christians. We still got people today blaming stuff on people. But Tacitus tells us this, and I want you to listen to this, okay? Because I want you to hear the faith of our brothers and sisters in that time and that place. A lot of us today, we're scared, we're afraid. We say, oh, I don't know who the next president's going to be. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to my pension. I don't know what's going to happen here and here. Listen, these people had none of those things. All they had was their lives. And listen to this. In spite of every human effort of the emperor's largest and of the sacrifices made to the gods, nothing sufficed to allay suspicion nor to destroy the opinion that the fire had been ordered by Nero. So this is the rumor that was circulating. But check this out. Nero blamed the Christians who are hated for their abominations. They didn't understand the church. And punished them with refined cruelty. Christ, from whom they take their name, was executed by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. Stopped for a moment. He stopped for a moment this movement. This evil superstition reappears, not only in Judea, where the root of the evil happened, but also in Rome, where all things and abominable from every corner of the world come together. All right, so here he's talking about, he says that, that we know who these people are. They followed this guy, Christus in Latin. They followed this guy. And, and Pontius Pilate thought he was going to stop the movement by crucifying this guy. But the movement came back. The movement comes back. And check this out. This first, those who confessed that they were Christians were arrested. So just by their confession, they're arrested. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Okay, you're coming with me. So they're arrested. And on the basis of their testimony, a great number were condemned, although not so much for the fire itself as for their hatred of humankind. They thought that Christians hated humankind. The Romans did. And then if we move on, listen to what uh, Nero did to them. Before killing the Christians, Nero used them to amuse the people. Some were dressed in furs to be killed by dogs. Others were crucified. Still others were set on fire early in the night so that they might illuminate it. Nero opened his own gardens for these shows, and in the circus he himself became a spectacle, for he mingled with the people dressed as the charioteer, and he rode his chariot around the circus. All this aroused the mercy of the people, even against these culprits who deserved an explanatory, explanatory punishment for it was clear that they were not being destroyed for the common good, but rather to satisfy the cruelty of one person. He takes the Circus Maximus, which is a huge arena, and how he lights it up at night for him to ride his chariot around in front of everybody, is he impales Christians and sets them on fire. And there they sit, burning. The, even the Roman citizens who saw this had pity on the Christians. Because they saw what Nero did to them to appease himself. Not for the common good, not to stop a movement that's against Rome, but to appease himself. That's written in red, folks. By their testimony, they were arrested. By their testimony. And they were willing to go through these things. And don't you think the rumors spread? Hey, if they come knock on your door... Don't tell them you're a Christian because they're going to do horrible things to you. But they stood in the face of that and said, here I am. Do what you want to to me. You know why? Because they believed in the resurrection. 
they believed the gospel so much they were willing to die for it. And so my challenge to you today is this, is what about you? Do you believe the gospel that much? Do I believe the gospel that much? Folks, this is the purpose of the church. This is the purpose. That Monday through Saturday, we are living our lives for the gospel. Because the gospel has saved us. We are living different lives now. We're now living for this. And not just for this that's around us. We're living for something greater than that. I want to have a time of invitation. we got just a few minutes. We can do this. I'm going to ask our band to come back up. They're going to play just a little bit. I want you to think about what we've been talking about. Because here's the thing. I want to see the church get excited again about the gospel. I want to see the church to quit being afraid of what's going on around us. We see all the stuff on the news and we get afraid. What if they come here? What if they do this? What if they do that? Listen, we don't have to be afraid because we know the one who controls it all. And so much so that he paid that price for us, we should be willing to pay that price for him. The gospel is that powerful of a message. But you want to know what happens? This is what happens. We get comfortable. We get complacent. I have my home. I have my car. I have my family. You can do whatever you want to. Don't touch any of these things because these are mine. My family has to have a place to live. I got to have a car to drive. Do whatever you want to out there. Just don't touch me or mine. We get comfortable. And I understand that. I like that too. But in the face of opposition, in the face of hostility, in the face of a culture that wants to say this is not true, we have to keep saying that it is true. You know why? Because it changed my life. If it changed your life, how can you say that this is not true if it's changed your life? So I want you to think about this. Let's everybody stand together.